So now on to tonight's program. The 2021 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor, the Downing Family Foundation and media partner, KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial counties. Tonight's speaker is Laura Engeman. Laura has a joint appointment between the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation and the California Sea Grant Extension Program. She specializes in providing California coastal communities with scientific research and tools to understand the impacts of climate change and inform adaptation strategies. Laura's research interests include improving methods for tracking coastal climate change trends and experimenting with adaptation strategies. This includes exploring innovative financing, policy changes, and developing academic community partnerships to broaden shared understanding of global science. She also serves on the Technical Advisory Council of the Governor's Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resilient Program, previously chaired the San Diego Sea, Live, sea Level Rise Working Group, and bringing this Nat Talk series full circle. She's a founding board member of the Climate Science Alliance. So she is uh, about the best person we could possibly find for this talk. So, and uh, we are absolutely thrilled uh, and honored to have you here. Thank you so much, Laura, and on to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Judy. It's great to be here. And again, thank you so much to the San, San Diego Natural History Museum and the Climate Science Alliance for coming up with this wonderful idea to host a climate series um, and have specific talks uh, related to topics and our local community. Um, so I hope that I can contribute to the wealth of information and great speakers that you've already had. And um, I look forward to engaging with any of the audience that's on today. Um, so with that wonderful introduction, I'll jump in uh, to our talk today, which uh, we titled Rising Waters. <laughs> um, it's appropriate today if anybody's been to the beach, we can see a lot of uh, waves coming up today, some pretty big stormy waters. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about sea level rise and uh, what it means for our community and how we can adapt. Um, so I wanted to start with a quick introduction, a little bit more about who I am and where I'm coming from in, ter in terms of coming to this space. Um, so I am a climate um, and coastal resilience specialist. So there's a number of ways that you can term that career choice, but essentially most of my career before these positions and in this current position have really focused on this intersection of communities today and in the future, coastal management, um, how we understand how our coast interacts with us, how do we manage our coast um, in response to changing conditions along the coast, and how do we use science to um, help us with that. Um, so a lot of the space that I uh, generally fill is around these big questions. So what do communities and leaders need to know? And how can scientists help answer those questions? So I'm gonna focus um, around some of those uh, big themes today with respect to sea level rise. And I just wanted to um, also acknowledge um, the fact that I come to this space because the coast to me is such a unique um, passion of mine you know, not only do we love to play in the water and surf, but I, I want to start this talk with the acknowledgement that the but that often our beaches and our ocean and our coast um, really drive home uh, a sense of community, a sense of connection, and so and to me that is one of the reasons why I love working in this space is because it really is about people connecting with nature. And oftentimes it's also the last sort of frontier when we're looking upon the ocean and really understanding sort of how we as one of the planet's species fit into the bigger picture of what's happening around our planet. And that sort of lays the groundwork for the discussion today. So with that, um, I am gonna cover a couple of topics today. Just wanna 
I, I'm not sure if she's on today, but I just want to thank the student Al Alicia or Alicia from High Tech High who emailed me as I was starting to think about prepping this talk. And she put pretty much these questions almost word for word in an email and asked me if I would answer them. And I thought, what a good framing for this talk. And hopefully I answer most of her questions and um, she's able to use this video for her school uh, home project. So we're gonna talk about what is sea level rise uh, and sort of what causes it, uh, how it impacts San Diego or how it will impact San Diego, you know, what we can do about it, and then sort of how you yourself can help to um, contribute to shaping the coast of our future. So uh, starting with what is sea level rise, uh, just gonna change this, okay. I uh, have to be able to see all my screens here. <laughs> so just starting with what sea level rise is. So sea level rise is a global phenomenon. Essentially, the earth is heating up, we're warming up, and that is largely due to emissions uh, that we're contributing to the atmosphere. And this has a feedback in on our planet's atmospheric and oceanic processes. So the big, the two big feedback mechanisms that we see and that drive sea level rise are um, temperature change in the atmosphere and the oceans. And this leads to an absorption of heat within the ocean, which then causes the ocean water to expand. And that means that our sea levels rise with that. And the second contributing factor um, is ice melt. And so ice melt essentially contribute is a contribution of several things. One is the ice masses around the, around the earth. These are largely Greenland and Antarctica, as well as the big mountain glaciers, uh, which are currently melting and adding freshwater. And then there may be some other contributed freshwater sources, uh, which can come from uh, groundwater or um, other, other ways that we're adding fresh water, mostly very small in small increments, whereas the ice sheets are the biggest contributor um, out of that pie. So then thinking about um, how, what causes sea level rise? How do we actually know that the sea is rising? How are we measuring it? Um, so since the 1880s, we've been measuring the sea level with tide gauges. Uh, we have a tide gauge in La Jolla is actually at the end of the Scripps uh, Pier. And that tide gauge, along with others across the US and across the globe, helped to draw a picture of how our global sea levels are changing over time. Then in the 1990s, we were able to advance um, this type of tracking using satellites. So the satellites are able to track the sea surface that bounces back, gives us sea level across the globe, and in comparing with that with the tide gauges, we feel pretty confident that we can now track sea level changes, uh, not just um, you know, globally at these locations, but sort of all around the globe and how they vary. Um, so in 2020, global mean sea level, meaning average sea level across the globe, set a record high of 3.6 inches above 1993 levels. So that's a little tough for us to understand in terms of what were 1993 levels, how much increase is that? Um, the takeaway is really that this represents essentially a doubling of sea level rise rates from the previous century. So in the last century, we jumped from about 0.06 inches a year to about 0.13 or 0.14 inches a year. And that doubling we anticipate to increase into the future. So what about locally here in San Diego? Our sea level rise, uh, our sea levels rising the same in San Diego as they are around the world? Um, this is a great question because this really gets at the local, it's a global phenomenon, meaning global drivers and processes are creating the sea level rise. However, its manifestation or how we see it um, ends up showing up differently around the world. This is known as relative sea level rise. And in some areas around the US is often higher 
um, often due to the land reference of, of the sea levels and where the land is sinking faster than the seas are rising. This is known as, as land subsidence or a more technical term, vertical land motion. So in San Diego, we generally track the global sea level rise rates uh, fairly closely. Uh, if you are to look at um, from this chart, 1900 to 2020, um, we have a slightly higher rate of approximately 10 inches since 1906. But in general, we're sort of tracking the global sea level rates uh, fairly closely as compared to other years or as compared to other locations. But if you look at a year to year cycle, you also see variations. And this is because in the Pacific, uh, we have cycles like El Nino that can temporarily cause sea levels to rise up to a foot or higher for a couple of years or um, couple, yeah, for a couple of years or a season. And then in addition to that, we also have uh, future projections where San Diego will vary from the rest of the world. And that is largely, um, or San Diego may vary from other parts of the world. And that is largely due to the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, the Antarctic, Antarctic ice sheet as it melts will contribute um, potentially up to 53% greater sea level rise in California um, than other locations around the globe. Um, so again, this is because of our oceanic uh, circulation processes. So when the ice melts in Antarctica, it moves into the Pacific circulation cycle, and then that tends to um, increase water levels in, in the Pacific, affecting California and the Southwest greater than other areas. Okay, so what does all this mean in terms of how we're seeing sea level rise impacts in San Diego today? and in the future. So first, I uh, wanna talk about flood frequency and intensity. So what we mean by intensity is sort of the duration uh, for how long, the, how long it would flood and what the height of the flooding is. And this picture is a, a event in Imperial Beach in January, 2019. And this is Seacoast Drive which often floods when tides are high and there's a moderate amount of wave energy. So that Imperial Beach example is a really good example of what we're gonna see in terms of high tide flooding due to sea level rise in the next 30 years. Uh, this graph shows a recent paper um, that was published and uh, by Thompson et al. And it basically shows us that it's projected or specifically the La Jolla Tide Gauge in our region, that we're gonna see a jump in flooding events from about 2030 up to 2043 um, to an increase of almost 50 days a year. Now this is in minor flooding events, meaning short-term nuisance type of flooding. Um, so uh, not as significant in terms of flood damages, but we will be seeing them recur enough that they may start to erode the shoreline and our assets and also become more costly to clean up. In addition, we'll also see a slower, a slightly less, but an uptick in moderate flooding events as well. So beyond those recurring high tide floods, we're also a wave exposed shoreline, which makes it really a great place to surf and draws a lot of folks to our um, coastal communities. But as these tides and water levels increase and happen more often, that means that even a moderate amount of wave energy can start to cause flooding as it runs up the shore and overtop structures. So we have started to see, uh, or we see this already happening um, in places like Imperial Beach, which is a photo on the right, um, on the left, you'll see Cardiff Seaside parking lot, uh, where similarly on a high tide, we often see the waves come up over the top of the parking lot. And we see it in a few other locations, including Oceanside. So then trickling down the sort of impacts to our region, this means, uh, of course, with more frequent floods, frequent flooding and wave storm events, this, that also contributes to uh, sort of an eating away and erosion of our shoreline. So San Diego does have a sand, what we call a sand deficit. 
that's largely uh, means that we don't have a natural replenishment of the sand to our beaches uh, because we've armored um, some of our cliffs as well as dammed a lot of our rivers and that's typically where the natural sediment flows from. So our beaches struggle to recover naturally from storm events. And you may have heard that in a, a number of locations across San Diego, we have done beach nourishment where we're sort of adding sand to the beach. And when we typically dredge our lagoons, we also add that sand to the beach. So we're kind of in this constant cycle of sort of trying to replenish our beaches normally. So as we start to see more flooding and high water, we're gonna see more and more erosion and it's just gonna become more challenging for our beaches to be able to recover and a bit more costly um, for us to maintain and repair. Finally, it's important to think about our coast as part of a larger landscape. Our rivers and estuaries and stormwater infrastructure all drain to the ocean. And at this, uh, specific coastal location where they drain, often those sort of floodplain areas or that infrastructure um, can be experiencing stressors from both sides, both the land side and the ocean side, meaning that extreme rainfalls events can produce runoff, that fresh, fresh water runoff is overwhelming the system from the land side of things, as well as the ocean is driving potentially wave energy or higher water um, flooding into the same area, leaving nowhere for the water to really go and increasing the flood risk. Uh, the other combination here could be landslides and debris. Um, you know, if we've got drought or wildfire, it loosens up the soils uh, with big rains, those come down our watersheds. They also end up on the coast. And this can call, cause blockages or exasper exacerbate flooding. So the point is we have to kind of think about these things as um, oftentimes, you know, sequential events, they might be think they might be events or seasons that happen one after another and sort of exacerbate the situation. They could be compound events where the rain, rainfall and the ocean driven flooding are happening at the same time. We are a Mediterranean climate, so we have these sort of extremes um, that, that can occur when they occur um, simultaneously. So what do we want to do about it? Um, and what can we do about it? Uh, so this is a bit of a complicated graph um, that was developed um, at Scripps with the help of the Tijuana Estuary Research Reserve. You don't have to look at it too closely. But essentially what it's depicting here are <clears throat> three time horizons um, that help us to kind of think about our sea level rise trajectory. So we've got here where we are in 2020, we've got 2050, 2080, and then the sort of unknown 2100, which is the extreme sea level um, scenario uh, trajectory that we could end up following. So going back to the very beginning of the presentation, um, how, how much extreme sea level we end up seeing is, is very much based on our emissions and global warming. We don't exact, we know what that, um, what our contribution of emissions now is, and we have a pretty good idea of how that's going to manifest in terms of sea level rise out to 2050. But then after 2050, a lot depends on our policies around emissions, as well as our um, trajectory for global warming and how extreme we're going to go. What that means for us today is that uh, no action today is really going to only further exacerbate our ability to respond and recover as we go forward. So it's um, it's important for us to think about how we're going to start uh, investing in uh, adaptation strategies and shoreline sh shoring up, if you want to use that term, um, today, and really start thinking about how we're how we want to transition our coast while we sort of have a moment to um, plan these and to get the funding available and to really work with the community to establish a vision. Um, for this sort of new coastal future. Because as you can see, as we climb this ladder, um, we are going to increasingly see these kind of flooding events and this erosion. And once again, we're stuck in a cycle of not being able to really respond and recover and um, really plan appropriately. So a much more reactive mode instead of a proactive mode. So what, uh, basically the bottom message of this graphic is sort of proactive choices today will really help our region to become more resilient to hazards in the future um, beyond 2050. 
So a couple of examples of what we can do about it today. Uh, I want to start with um, really thinking about our natural systems and what we can enhance on our shorelines today. So we are in Southern California. A lot of Southern California has been developed and modified. However, we do have natural systems, whether they're estuaries or wetlands or beaches. And in some of those areas, we can enhance those systems to essentially give nature a boost in providing um, its natural capacity to sort of weather storms and recover from uh, flood and storm events. Um, this can mean enhancing coastal beaches, uh, dunes, um, helping uh, wetlands, helping restore wetlands and providing them um, more ability to sort of absorb flood water and transition habitats. Um, and we, we do have a fair amount of these systems in our community. Um, many of them have been degraded, but helping sort of restore their functions and structures and then thinking about how they might transition into the future um, can really help us to sort of remove that squeeze on these systems and um, help potentially protect our community and, and infrastructure at the same time. So uh, let me just show you what this, so let me tell you what this picture is. This is actually down at Borderfield State Park, which is in Imperial Beach right at the uh, US-Mexican border. Um, they do have some coastal dunes that are backed by the Tijuana estuary there. And in this case, the dunes had uh, been somewhat eroded and uh, fragmented. And here they used uh, one type of technique where you're essentially um, creating a mechanism for trapping the sands and helping the sand to sort of rebuild hummocks or these sort of dune um, structures uh, on the beach. So another example of what we can do is enhancing coastal protection. Uh, traditionally, we've thought of this in a very uh, hard shoreline way. So groins, uh, seawalls, um, you know, specific sort of hard protection. But increasingly, we're starting to think about how we can develop um, hybrid systems that more mimic our natural function and processes and provide co-benefits um, in terms of resilience for those systems. So here we have an example of uh, Cardiff. Uh, this is in the South Encinitas. You see Cardiff Boulevard in the, um, you see the coast highway here that was getting flooded and overtopped. And there was a set of uh, rock, rock armoring along here um, as a temporary emergency measure. So they were able to, they designed a feature where they uh, buried that rock and then they covered it with sands and vegetated it to essentially create an artificial berm, uh, artificial berm or dune structure. And that can also provide ha um, potentially a habitat for, uh, for plovers or, or beach nesting. So these types of systems, as I mentioned, are are really focused on kind of protect, protection. They may be focused on a bit more of a short-term strategy. So buying us time um, to invest in these sort of bigger infrastructure projects where we either have to elevate or relocate or really think hard about what, how we're gonna continue to provide those services. And then another uh, strategy to add to sort of our menu is thinking about how we accommodate uh, flooding um, as we start seeing it moving forward. So there's a number of ways that we can do this. So uh, in some sense, we might be upgrading or retrofitting infrastructure. And a lot of times, maybe that infrastructure already needed upgrades. So this could be stormwater systems um, that are currently kind of at their capacity. And with any increased flooding, uh, they are no longer going to be viable. This could also be thinking about public access points, bikeways, bike paths, um, coastal uh, coastal pathways, coastal stairs, you know, that we may have uh, maintained and repaired over and over again in the past. Do we need to think about sort of redirecting those or um, how we can shore them up a little bit better to continue to provide those services? And the third piece uh, is improving our flood forecasting system. 
um, and capabilities. So this is an example of the Imperial Beach flood forecast forecasting system, which was developed as part of a team project um, with researchers at Scripps, including um, myself and the city of Imperial Beach. Uh, we were able to sort of look at uh, you'll see the yellow line is marked as mild overtopping threshold. The red one is uh, moderate. So these are essentially the flood risk thresholds. And then we, the dark blue is the, um, the sea level rise with tides and the light blue is the wave contribution. So being able to couple that and really look at a local beach and situation and what conditions cause um, higher risk for flooding in those events and starting to track how often those events are happening and providing bottom line the city with at least a three to five day outlook um, and giving them some time to better prepare for these flooding events, whether it's with sandbags or closing streets or uh, notifying the residents. And then uh, last on the list is kind of thinking about how we trans transition different uses of the coast and or relocate um, and reappropriate uh, different uses. So this is an example of South Carlsbad Boulevard, another project um, that I've been involved with. And here in the bottom left, you'll see this is an, uh, a graph showing uh, cliff steepening hazards. As you go to the right hand side, you'll see that the cliff is eroding um, pretty close up to the roadway. So in the future, we anticipate some safety issues with that road. And as further south, you'll see that the road is overtopped by waves during specific flooding events. And so this project is really looking at uh, how much cliff erosion we've seen in the past, how much we might project in the future, um, how we potentially, how the city of Carlsbad is, um, is looking at realigning this road and combining it with the northbound version of South Carlsbad Boulevard, and then potentially uh, allowing reuse of this area temporarily for recreational um, and visitor, uh, visitor use. Okay, so, Combining all of those adaptation strategies together, uh, we're, we need to sort of look at what is a best fit, what's best suited for what locations, what's best suited for where we're seeing hazards today, where we anticipate seeing more hazards into the future. And one piece of this puzzle is to really make sure that we're thinking about historic context as well. We do live in a coast, as I mentioned before, that is heavily altered in many ways. So for example, Mission Bay once called False Bay because it was fairly shallow and operated more as a marsh than a bay, you know, was after, uh, night, after World War II was significantly built up as an aquatic park, which include dredging and creating small islands or diverting the San Diego River, a lot of modifications to the natural system. Um, there is a retention of, uh, of wetlands in this area. Um, but we have to understand that we have significantly modified this area. And so restoring a lot of these areas back to their natural function isn't really the purpose that we're trying to achieve these days. We have to think about the fate of these resources and the fate of the function and habitats and species, as well as the people in the context of sea level rise and climate change, which essentially means that we have to have a new vision, right? And we have to sort of revision our coast once again. At the same time, we have to respect who should be involved in that discussion about revisioning our coast. Um, and as mentioned before, uh, you know, our, tri our indigenous communities, our tribal communities in San Diego, historically, many of them reached um, and used and traded within the coastals coastal within our coastal areas. So they maintain coastal connections to the coast and they have specific coastal ac uh, resources that are important to them. We should also think about not just who uses the beach today, who visits the beach today, but we should think about who has used and visit visited our coastal areas in the past. What other cultural connections are there that people have had to these sites? And then thinking forward, 
what cultural connections do we want to also maintain? What's important for us to sort of provide equitable and um, sort of ho and a holistic vision of how people and how future generations are going to use the coast? So with that, I, um, you know, we'll jump in here to this beautiful picture of the Imperial Beach Bayshore Bikeway, which is on the South Bay of, um, which is on the South San Diego Bay. This is a trail that's used by a lot of folks to enjoy um, the coast and the surrounding areas. And they're undergoing a sea level rise uh, adaptation planning process for this um, currently. And this is just a great example for thinking about you know, how we as a community are working towards this sort of new transitional, inclusive, holistic vision toward of the future. We have to remember that our coastal systems are dynamic. That means that they are not meant to sort of hold the line and stay put. They have always moved, they've always transitioned, and we have to be able to adapt and change with them if we're going to let those systems do what they do best, which is sort of adapt and recover and respond. Um, to these extreme events and then sort of build themselves back up again. So we have to come together as a community to think about community and regional plans for protection, for accommodation, for transition. We have to willing, willingly be open and inclusive. And we have to appreciate that this sense of place, going back to my very first conversation with you, the sense of place, the sense of connection that drives people to want to live, enjoy, and connect with the coast and ocean is, is not just something that we, this current generation, experience, but people of the past have. And we don't need to acknowledge that future generations will likely want to continue this connection to the coast. So just how we do this and just how we transition this is still sort of an unknown uh, area of, ex of experimentation. And with that, my last slide is really about that. It's really about how you can get involved and understanding that whatever, wherever community, whatever expertise, whatever your background, you can be involved in this conversation because it is one giant sort of experiment and learning process. And um, I really love this picture that um, actually came from the Bay Foundation, Santa Monica Bay Foundation in LA, where they um, took a historically graded beach and heavily used area in LA, and they're um, they've they've allowed dunes to sort of rebuild and helping to educate uh, folks about um, what the beaches look like and, and that they aren't just volleyball courts. So this just really gets to our perception of what the beaches should be and what our coastal areas should be and kind of getting people to open that um, box up. And lastly, I'll give you sort of my list of how you can get involved. Uh, number one, global warming our sea level rise is dependent on global warming, which is dependent on our emissions. So however you can help contribute to reducing emissions is going to help us with that trajectory of sea level rise going forward. Uh, many of your San Diego and local cities and counties and agencies are currently developing sea level rise plans. Uh, weighing in on those processes is a great way to provide your voice and perspective. In addition, if you are in a location that floods or erodes or you have access to those coastal areas, documenting it um, when you can has also been extremely helpful for the science community as well as for um, the city planners that are sort of thinking about prioritizing. So please do share those photos with myself at Sea Grant, at Scripps, or um, through your city uh, office. The third thing is um, help be a voice for those who can't, whether that's natural habitat and species, whether that's future generations, whether it's those that need equitable access and use to the beach. Help us make it a diverse and holistic and equitable conversation. And last, be open to new ideas and new visions of stewardship and transitioning of the coast. We all sort of hold on to some of those things that we in particular love to do at the beach, but being able to sort of balance it all is going to be a tough challenge. So I really invite you to come experiment, come monitor, come evaluate, come learn, and come join us in this conversation. And with that, I will finish up and open it up to questions.